Adab. In the summer of 2013, I was heartbroken by the death of a patient I had grown very close to. She had come to my clinic practically every week for almost a decade. Losing her was like losing a best friend. In my despondency, I wrote a piece on Lady N that began with an excerpt from W. H. Auden's poem, Miss G, telling the story of a spinster living in the sexually repressed English society of the 1930s. Today, things like the safety and normalcy of single women living by themselves or the serial relationships of unmarried women are entirely socially acceptable. This is in sharp contrast with the pitied and patronized single women who were mocked as social failures not so long ago. The Beatles actually wrote about such a woman in what is one of my favorite songs. Eleanor Rigby picks up the rice in the church where a wedding has been lives in a dream, waits at the window, wearing a face that she keeps in a jar by the door. Who is it for? All the lonely people, where do they all come from? All the lonely people, where do they all belong? Auden takes this concept further in his poem, Miss G to shatter a long-held view that loneliness can cause disease. Auden and Susan Sontag, in fact, have used illness as metaphor. I'm going to read an excerpt now from Miss G, but I suggest you read the whole poem. Let me tell you a little story about Miss Edith G. She lived in Clevedon Terrace at number 83. She bicycled down to the doctor and rang the surgery bell. Oh, doctor, I have a pain inside me and I don't feel very well. Dr. Thomas looked her over and then he looked some more, walked over to the wash basin and said, why didn't you come before? Mm. Dr. Thomas sat over his dinner. Though his wife was waiting to ring, rolling his bread into pellets, said, cancer's a funny thing. Nobody knows what the cause is, though some pretend they do. It's like some hidden assassin waiting to strike at you. Childless women get it, and men when they retire. Childless women get it and men when they retire, it's as if there had to be some outlet for their foiled creative fire. Is cancer really a disease of repressed emotions? Is it more common in childless women and retired men? No, of course not. My patient Lady N certainly was not repressed. Yes, she led a very lonely life. She was married briefly once, was childless, and lived by herself for decades. But here's a short description of her from my book, The First Self. Quote, she was high-spirited and boisterous with a rowdy, uproarious personality that sparkled with wit and humor, possessing an uncanny habit of connecting seeming, seemingly unrelated things through common sense extreme intelligence, inimitable humor, and pure and simple intuition. And most importantly, she had a blazing, sizzling passion for life, writ large all over her massive 5 foot 10 inch frame." Unquote. The morning after my piece on Lady Anne was published, I received a call from a Dr. Edward Mendelssohn, professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. Dr. Raza, he said, you quoted some lines from Miss G in your essay. I just wanted to let you know that if you want to quote the whole poem, you will need permission from the estate of W.H. Auden. 
I thanked him. And then I asked him why he, a purely academic English professor, was involved in copyright issues. He rather shyly informed me that while teaching at Yale as a young professor, he had met and befriended Auden. Their relationship deepened to the point where Auden appointed Ed Mendelssohn as his literary executive. And this is why if Auden is quoted anywhere in print, Professor Mendelssohn receives an instant alert. In my case, though, he called me not because I had been delinquent in any way, but because he liked my essay and was curious about a poetry quoting oncologist. So much for the reputation of physicians and scientists. Anyway, this led me to read Professor Mendelssohn's book titled, The Things That Matter. What seven classic novels have to say about stages of life. I love this book. Professor Mendelssohn describes how Oscar Wilde explained what fiction is through, uh, what fiction is through the words of Miss Prism in The Importance of Being Earnest. Quote, the good end happily and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. <laughs> Indeed, Wilde is spot on because in real life, what we see is just the opposite. The bad are generally lording it over the good. So this leads to the question of who is good and why do they end happily only in fiction? The point Professor Mendelssohn makes is this, quote, in real life, the good are not rewarded with attractive and wealthy spouses, nor are they rescued at the last moment from loneliness or oppression. In real life, the race is to the swift and the battle to the strong. But in one small and crucial region of real life, the fiction proves to be true. It is in the inner life in the psychological realm to the degree that you can manage to belong to Miss Prism's category of the good, you become more calm, more brave, less anxious, less envious, more capable of enduring injustice or disaster. And it is in this inner life that individuality takes shape, not in the outer world of appearances, end of quote. In other words, the good are not necessarily the ones with money or power, but the ones who find a robust inner life that is good. It's good because they can distinguish between the things that matter and those that don't. Which brings me to the reason why I'm here this evening, a few thousand miles away from home, for practically 24 hours, to offer my respect to the memory of Zohra Husseini. As she seemed to know instinctively about what were the things that matter, false claims to morality could not fool her. She flatly rejected any forced value that infringed upon one's freedom, especially the freedom of women. She knew how to separate truth from falsehood. She reacted when she saw injustice. She promoted her values, her principles through countless speeches, essays, research papers, book contributions, participation in communal, social, cultural, and even political activities leading the community by example, setting the highest standards for herself and those around her, using her lived experiences to define the values we should all be seeking as individuals. I'll summarize the distinction between what matters and what must be rejected using the words of Faiz Ahmad Faiz. Talib hai agar hum to fakat haq ke talabgar. Batil ke mukabil mein sadaqat ke paristar. Insaf ke, neki ke, maravat ke tarafdar, or zalim ke mukhalif hai to bekas ke madadgar. 
اور جو ظلم پہ لانت نہ کرے آپ لئی ہے جو جبر کا منکر نہیں وہ منکر دی ہے The reason I talked about Eleanor Rigby, Ms. G and Lady N earlier is to show how utterly astounding Zohra was. Because given the time and place where she grew up, she could easily have had a lonely, unappreciated life like them. Instead, what emerged was an <coughs> astonishing life full of purpose, full of accomplishments, full of productivity, full of social and professional successes, and above all, full of love. Love that she gave, she received, and she returned with a breathtaking generosity. Through a singular largesse of spirit, she became a mother to three beautiful children who are exceptionally successful adults today thanks to Murad and Yavar and Ashi, and to Azar, her fourth and most beloved child, and now to Yusra, the adored daughter-in-law, for organizing such a beautiful tribute and for giving me the opportunity to speak. All of you seem to understand, both instinctively and thanks to her tarbiyat, that real legacy does not mean leaving something behind for other people. It means leaving something behind in other people. We are gathered here tonight as a testament to your internalization of her values. You are showing your devotion to her and your appreciation of what she stood for by making certain that she and her values are not forgotten that her legacy survives. Congratulations to all of you and to the extended family for acknowledging her stature in the community by perpetuating her memory through multiple steps that she would have loved. A wonderful legacy one can leave behind is also happy memories, of course. And all of us who knew her have plenty of those where Zora was concerned. She and I bonded over poetry, and especially over Faz. She briefly stayed with me in Manhattan once, and our conversation was totally peppered with poetry. We recited ghazal after ghazal by alternating the completion of shares. Here is one that I knew was her favorite. Kab tak dil ki khair manaye, kab tak rah dikhlaoge. Kab tak chain ki mohlat doge, kab tak yaad na aoge. Or bita deed umid ka mosam, ha kurti hai aakho me. Kab bejoge dard ka badal, kab barkha barsaoge. Or ehde wafa ya tarke mohabbat, jo chaho so aap karo. Apne bas ki baati kya hai, hum se kya manbaoge. اور کس نے وصل کا سورج دیکھا کس پر ہجر کی رات ڈھلی کس نے وصل کا سورج دیکھا کس پر ہجر کی رات ڈھلی گیسوں والے کون تھے کیا تھے ان کو کیا جتلا ہو گئے If we think more seriously about this particular شیر فیض is pointing to something more profound than the conventional وصل and ہجر when he says, Kis ne basl ka suraj dekha, kis par hijr ki raat dhali? Rather, what he appears to be asking is a more universal question about who has ever realized all their wishes, seen their dreams come true. In fact, it seems not just impossible, but almost in vain to even recall those dreams because he concludes by saying, Gesuo wale kon the, kya the? ان کو کیا جتلا ہوگے it's this above all to thine own self be true that Zohra understood very well Faiz Saab ends the ghazal by saying something that applied to us as our friendship was sustained by the lutf o karam of a unique husn Faiz dilon ke bhaag mein hai ghar bharna bhi lut jana bhi 
کیا بات کہی ہے فیض دلوں کے بھاگ میں ہے گھر بھرنا بھی لٹ جانا بھی تم اس حسن کے لطف و کرم پر کتنے دن اترا ہو گیا کب تک دل کی خیر منائے کب تک یاد نہ آؤ گے کب تک چین کی مہلت دو گے کب تک یاد نہ آؤ گے یو بی جسٹیفائڈ ان آسکنگ وائی سم ون لائک می ہو میٹ زورا بٹ اے ہینڈ فل آف ٹائمس فیلس کانفیڈنٹ ان اسپیکنگ ٹو ہر سینسبلٹیز ویل دیر آر کاؤنٹ لیس ریزنس فار دس ناٹ دا لیسٹ آف وچ آر آر کلچرل اینڈ فیملی بیک گراؤنڈ آر شیئر ایتھوز آر ان بریکبل بٹ کنٹینیوس ڈائریکٹ اینڈ ان ڈائریکٹ کمیونیکیشنز آر فیملیز ہیو بین کلوز فار جنریشنز اینڈ لو فار دا سیدینس has been crispered into the DNA of Raza's since birth. Growing up, for me, Zora's dad, Khwaja Ghulamus Sayyidan, his sister and her puppy, Saleha Abid Hussain, and her husband, Dr. Abid Hussain, were my ideals. <clears throat> the credit for this goes to our parents on both sides, who despite unimaginable obstacles across the tense post-partition borders, refuse to let their personal relationships be affected. They visited each other when possible, stayed in touch in a hundred ways, and above all, they managed to sow the seeds of love even in the hearts of their children on both sides, a love that has already lasted a gener- several generations, as you see. Then as an adult, I met Zora's younger sister, Zakia, in Delhi. One look was all it took. It was love at first sight, at least for me. Love that has only blossomed into an unabashed adoration for decades now. How I worship Zakia, who's going through unspeakable personal tragedies at the moment. Once again, with her signature grace. I'm doing my best to be by her side as soon as a visa is granted. Sayyada, the beloved's youngest sister, has visited me in many cities including Buffalo, Chicago and more recently New York. It's always a much anticipated trip and an unadulterated pleasure to be in Sayyada's company. Zakia and Sayyada hosted me and my husband Harvey with unparalleled generosity during our visit to Delhi and Zora did the same on our visit to Edmonton. I got to spend quality time with her, as did Harvey. The Raza family's love for the Sayyidan sisters and their children is natural for us and knows no bounds. But my most direct connection to Zora, of course, is through my sister Amra, or Bibi, who has lived with me for decades and who has regaled me with countless wonderful Zora stories. Bibi and Zora shared a very special bond. To me, both represent the acme of high culture practiced in our part of the world. Our nuanced and gorgeous tehzeeb, one that they so lightly display in every gesture, every action, one that I aspire to. I'm here not only at the invitation of the Hamid family, a compelling enough reason to come, but also as a tribute to this special Bibi Zora relationship as a genuine reflection of the love and regard our two families have for each other for practically a century now. Our parents first met in 1935. I'm here to reaffirm my commitment that this love will continue with renewed vigor and not less. Here's a Zora story that Bibi once told me. Apparently, some Gora friends of Zora wanted to know about her unique literary traditions. Zora spontaneously recited a poem that not only ravished them, but it's a lovely contribution of Urdu to the universal canon of humanity's combined grand accomplishments. One that addresses the asrar azal the existential, the essential mysteries, the wonders of the world first. And then it moves on to define 
what our goals, our roles should be in this world, what we should be striving for, and ends by providing a precise prescription for how to get there. I was so smitten by it that not only did I memorize the whole Nazm immediately, I also made my daughter do the same. Shehrzad, my daughter, can still recite the entire thing from memory when I ask her from time to time during one of my mehfils. Kholak, zami dek, falak dek, fiza dek, mashrik se ubharte huye, suraj ko zara dek, is jalwaye be parda ko parde me neha dek, Ayame judai ke sitam dek, jafa dek, betab na ho, mar kae bimo raja dek, kholak, zami dek, falak dek, fiza dek. Hai tere tasarruf me ye badal ye ghatai, ye gumba de aflak, ye khamosh fizai, ye ko, ye sehra, ye samander, ye hawai, or ti pesh nazar kalt of farishtoki adai. और आई नए अयाम में आज अपनी अदा देख खोलांक जमी देख फलक देख फिजा देख समझेगा जमाना तेरी आंखों के इशारे देखेंगे तुझे दूर से गर्दों के सितारे और नापैद तेरे बहरे तखयुल के कनारे भेजेंगे पहुंचेंगे फलक तक तेरी आंखों के शरारे तामीर खुदी कर Asare ahe rasa dek, kholak, zami dek, falak dek, fiza dek. And now the prescription for you can do. Khurshid jahan taab ki zo tere sharar mein, abad hai ek taza jahan tere hunar mein, jachte nahi bakshe huye firdaus nazar mein, aur jannat tere pinha hai tere khun jigar mein. Ay packer gil, कोशिश पहम की जजा देख खोलांक जमी देख फलक देख फिजा देख मशरक से उभरते हुए सूरज को जरा देख I began this talk with a description of the life of Lady N. He was a woman who bravely tried to ward off multiple assaults on her life from that merciless assassin known as cancer for a decade and she died a lonely death. Lady Anne reminded me of Eleanor Rigby and then the poem Miss G, which led me to compare these three lives with the starkly different one that Zora led. The question is, what made Zora so different? Is it something we can emulate? If yes, then what exactly is it that we should all be seeking in life? What should we, what should we be seeking in life? According to Dostoevsky, it's goodness. But according to Nietzsche, it's greatness. Since goodness is its own reward, what reward would greatness bring? Well, there is no greatness without some goodness. And therefore, seeking either will bring the other automatically. Here's a prescription for the shortest route towards achieving both. The necessary requirement is to overcome one's indifference to the world and realize that we only exist in relation to others around us. In this connected life then, emphasis is placed on interdependence rather than isolation and self-reliance. Recognizing this connectivity immediately results in developing empathy. Empathy for the other which translates to developing ties to the community. Goodness comes from empathy for all living things. And the best part is that when such goodness is combined with action, greatness automatically results. So what kind of action is the prime mover here? It is justice. Justice must be sought not just for the self, but for every individual in the community especially those who are obviously being mistreated. Glaringly, this means practically one half of the human species that is female. And this is a cause that was close to Zora's heart. Another path to greatness is to acquire knowledge 
and then use that knowledge for the good of the community. Why is knowledge so important? Why is knowledge preferably a better thing to pursue than wealth? Well, here is the first Sufi, Ali ibn Abi Talib, explaining why acquiring knowledge is better than acquiring wealth. You need to guard your wealth, but knowledge guards you. A man of wealth has many enemies, but a man of knowledge many friends. Distribution increases knowledge, reduces wealth. A learned person is generous, while the wealthy tend to be miserly. Wealth can be stolen, not knowledge. Knowledge judges, while wealth is judged. Wealth decreases with time, knowledge increases. Knowledge is boundless, wealth has a limit. Knowledge illuminates the mind while wealth is apt to darken it. Wealth puffs up pride, knowledge teaches humility. And finally, above everything else, wealth takes away a certain humanity, while knowledge induces compassion, kindness, empathy, love, humanity. And this is the point I've been trying to make about the things that matter. Empathy is essential and pursuit of knowledge makes you develop empathy. That certain dard -e dil our poets teach us the way to develop dard -e dil. Tamanna dard -e dil ki ho to kar khidmat faqeeron ki. Tamanna dard -e dil ki ho to kar khidmat faqeeron ki. Nahi milta ye gohar baad shahon ke khazino mein. One of my favorite writers is Miss Annie Dillard, who won the Pulitzer Prize for her incredibly beautiful book, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. She was asked once, how she chose the name of her latest collection of essays titled The Abundance. Ms. Dillard replied that over the last few decades, she has been collecting interesting sayings in her journal. There's a line from the Quran, which is particularly beautiful and forms the basis of the title of her book called The Aban Abundance. Here is the quotation. They will question thee concerning what should they expend. Expend is different than spend. Expend is things you can do without. They will question thee, what should they expend? Say the abundance. Give it all away. The reference is not just to money and material goods, but the real appeal is for you to give of yourself. The abundance. What are the things you have infinite <coughs> supply of that you can never run out of, that you can truly give away with greater and greater abundance and only get richer and richer? I'm going to use Emily Dickinson to answer this question. Mea kalpa. I have changed one word in this poem. The brain is wider than the sky, for hold them side by side. The brain is, because our imagination is limitless, right? The brain is wider than the sky, for hold them side by side. The one, the other will contain with ease and you besides. The brain is deeper than the sea or hold them blue to blue. The brain is wider than the sky, for hold them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease and you besides. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue, the one the other will absorb as sponges buckets do. You know, a little sponge can soak up a whole bucket of water. 
brain is deeper than the sea for hold them blue to blue the brain is deep, deeper than the sea for hold them blue to blue the one the other will absorb as sponges buckets do the brain is just the weight of love for half them pound for pound and they will differ if they do as syllable from sound this is the point i'm making you give more and more of your brain and your heart and you will fill up from behind the abundance the crucial thing is for you to realize that no man is an island and tire of itself each is a piece of the continent part of the main each man's death diminishes me because i am involved in mankind and therefore never sent to know for whom the bell tolls it tolls for thee realizing that we are not islands but parts of the main augurs empathy empathy means giving and giving means give what you have abundance of and abundance means give as much as you can of your brain and your heart so i leave everyone listening to my talk not just the young but everyone in this room to not be afraid of giving away your knowledge and giving away your love this is what life is all about these are the things that matter and this is why today i've titled my lecture the genius of giving in concluding this talk i'd like to show you what the ideal combination of goodness and greatness can look like since zora was raised in a deeply poetic culture i'd like to do this using poetry to define the epistemologies of beauty of husn no one has done it better than our poets especially one of zora's favorites fares who himself underwent an aesthetic period where all he wrote was gorgeous romantic poetry just paying tribute to beauty and husn the poem about i'm about to recite is called ek reh guzar par that appears somewhere in the middle of daste saba in a larger sense i am reading this poem not just for zora but for bibi and zakia and sayeda and for all the men and all the women in this room and everywhere who are seeking the things that matter to varying degrees personifying this husn they are working hard to develop character that is honed and filtered refined and metabolized over decades of reading thinking creating loving caring and thus ending up with inner lives that could rightfully belong to miss prism's category of the good the good that ends up happily not just in fiction but in real life as well it is the only good that always ends well in fact and ends in greatness of the soul brings its own satisfaction that makes you become more calm more brave less anxious less envious more capable of enduring injustice or disaster back to ek reh guzar par i urge you to think of these words as fair saab lays down the ultimate description of husn of beauty this is a description also of the ehsani tradition of all the sufi philosophy a tradition that seeks ehsani is a word from husn this is a tradition of sufism which seeks beauty and rejects ugliness especially in one's conduct this is the husn that you should seek and you can find and if you don't it won't matter because what matters is that you tried and you tried and you never gave up remember what you find the zen that you find on top of the mountains after you climb all the way up is the zen you brought with yourself 
Husn is something that Zohra personified with an effortless superiority. She was exceptionally elegant in everything she did. She exuded class. She was confident, intelligent, independent, loving and strong. She was the one who showed us beyond any shadow of doubt that if you have positive eyes, you will love the world. But if you have a positive tongue, the world will love you. Zora had both. She loved the world and in return, we loved her back. Promise yourselves that you will strive for the same. Realizing that the only way to ultimately achieve this level of khusn I'm about to describe is through only one thing, which is the genius of giving. Listen to the description of this husn now and feel the presence of Zohra in her own home tonight. दीद में लाखों मसरतें पिन्हा वो जिसकी दीद में लाखों मसरतें पिन्हा वो हुस्न जिसकी तमन्ना में जन्नतें पिन्हा हजार फितने तहे पाए नाज खाक नशीन और भरेक निगाह खुमारे शबाब से रंगीन शबाब जिससे तखयुल पे बिजलियां बरसें वकार जिसकी रफाकत को शोखियां तरसें और अदाए लफ्ज शे पापर कयामत ने कुर्बान और बयाज रुख पे शहर की सबाहतें कुर्बान सियाह जुल्फों में वारफ्ता निखतों का हुजूम तवील रातों की ख्वाबीदा राहतों का हुजूम वो होठ फैस वो होठ वो आँख जिसके बनावट पे खाल कितराए जबान शेर को तारीफ करते शर्म आए वो होठ फैस से जिसके बहार लाला फरोश और बहिश्त कौसरो तस्नीम व सलसबील बदोश गदाज जिसम कबा जिस पे सज के नाज करे और दराज कद जिसे सर्वे सही नमाज करे गरज वो हुसन जो मोहताज वसफ नाम नहीं वो हुसन जिसका तस्वुर बशर का काम नहीं किसी जमाने में इस रह गुजर से गुजरा था बसद गुरूर व तजमुल इधर से गुजरा था और अब ये राह गुजर भी है दिल फरेब व हसीन कि इसकी खाक में इसकी खाक में कैफे शराब व शेर मकी और हवा में शोखिए रफ्तार की अदाएँ हैं फिजा में गर्मी गुफ्तार की सदाएँ हैं गरज व हुसन अब इस रह का जुज्व मंजर है और नयाज इश्क को एक सिजद गाह मैसर है जोरा हुसैनी जिंदाबाद लॉन्ग लिव जोरा थैंक यू वेरी मच